Uh, hi, my name is Sudhuve Mokri. I'm the author of Angel Nightingale. Thanks for everybody that coming here on a Sunday. I really appreciate that. Uh, a little bit about me, I was born and raised in Iran, uh, what I call it the land of trouble these days. <laughs> uh, I was the oldest of four. I had three younger brothers. My parents were very loving, kind, and extremely generous. They always reached out to help other people. My dad used to say, I do this thing because I know that when my kids are needing help, someone is going to reach out and take care of them. And that was really, truly the story of my life, and that's the reason I wrote my book. Um, I experienced a lot of challenges and struggles in my life growing up. Uh, when I was 19 years old, uh, it was one year after revolution took place in Iran. I was uh, in a very peaceful demonstration um, because they were trying to close all the universities and colleges in order to expel all the students, instructors, professors from the, um, all, everywhere, all around the country. And if they weren't thinking and following the new government's rules and ideology. Um, I was one of them. I was captured. I was tortured and beaten into a coma. Uh, one week in a coma, I uh, came back to life uh, with the grace of God, and which is the stories in the book. And I was released and didn't go to jail. I was one of the lucky ones because there were lots of people that they were raped, they were killed and they were, uh, their lives just ended at that time. My father died when I was 13 years old, and he had a sudden heart attack, and a couple of days, and he was gone. He was my hero, and he was my cheerleader. He taught me always to speak up and live a life with integrity and honesty, and that's how he lived his life. Um, I grew up on stage performing. I was always dancing, I was singing, uh, reciting poems, uh, performing, acting. But after he died, um, part of me died. I went to uh, experience, a, it was a long journey of depression. I attempted suicide a couple of times, and I talk in my book about that. Um, after that, there was no performances. There was no dancing and nothing for me. Um, I just died. And the day that they, we buried my father, part of me was buried with him. Um, my mom was a teacher, and she had to work really, really hard. And two jobs to make sure that take care of four kids. And uh, my parents adopted a, a daughter, a daughter girl that she became my sister, adopted sister. She was, when I was 10 years old, she was the same age. So she had to, my mother had to work really hard to um, provide for five kids. As a um, result of my mother working outside of the home, I became the caregiver. I was the one taking care of my little brothers. The little one was only two years old. Um, I lost myself uh, growing up uh, through this process. I didn't know who I was. I felt, as you, you know, everybody say, I'm very short. I was the shortest from all of my family. Everybody was tall. It was always a, why don't you just jump a little bit and play <laughs> basketball and, you know, get taller? So that I perceived that as I was not good enough. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't beautiful. I never uh, fit in in any place. I got married. Um, I had a four-year-old son, and seven or, yeah, I was pregnant seven months uh, with my daughter. Uh, my husband was an activist as well as I was. And one day he came home and he said, I'm sorry, I have bad news. Um, I cannot stay here in Iran anymore. My life is in danger, so what should we do? I said, we're going to sell everything. And he had a brother and sister in America, actually in Portland. And then he left. Um, I delivered my child, my daughter. Two years passed, and I cannot bring you. I cannot bring you two and a half years. And my younger brother, he was about a year and a half younger than me. And one day he said, 
I don't think he's going to take you to America. There is something going on. What, what if, because we didn't have American embassy in Iran after the revolution took place, he said, why don't I take care of my passport and take you to Turkey, to American embassy? You tell them, maybe they feel sorry for you and they let you because I didn't have a life. I was going from my mother's house to my sister-in-law's house to my mother-in-law's house, and I was going around and around the risk of my life and my family because if they would have known and none of my coworkers knew, none of my friends would knew, none of my you know, family would know that my husband is not here. He's in America, he had to escape. So when my brother was working on getting his passport, he, um, he was married. His wife was uh, pregnant seven months and they had a four-year-old son. Exactly the same time, the same situation that when my brother, my husband left me and came to America. And he suddenly died in a car accident. That was it for me. I, my world just crumbled and uh, I was angry for a very long time asking God, why didn't you take me? Why didn't you take my kids? We, didn't, we don't have anything here. We're here with no nothing. I had to work. 15 days in a row, I was a nurse in Iran. And one day off and 15 days in a row, and that was my life. And I had no way of transportation, had to take two buses. I was miserable. And on the top of everything, that the only hope that I had to get out of the, the country and be safe and join my husband was my brother. And you killed my brother. Um, so my husband, a couple of weeks later, after he found out that my brother was you know, gone, he said, okay, I have a friend in Turkey. Why don't you get everything and move there? Long story is in the book and the challenges that I faced and I almost lost my daughter when I was in Turkey. And when I came here, I found out that my family was right. He had another life. And he said, I'm not in love with you. This is it. He left. And I was like, really? What now? I didn't have any family, I didn't have any friends, I didn't have any money because the leftover money that I had after selling all of the stuff, I brought it here and he took it. And I couldn't even speak English. I had no idea what, what am I going to do. There is one thing I was sure, I am not going back to Iran. And that was the only thing I knew. My faith in God and the love that I had for my children was the only reason I would wake up every day. I had to say, and I attempted suicide, it wasn't successful. So I thought, okay, you are not gonna take me, are you? <laughs> I knew that I had to do something. I, my faith was so strong and I knew that God wouldn't bring me here and leave me without anything. So I prayed, that was the only thing that I knew how to do. And cried myself to sleep every night, and he answered. Not physically for me to be able to hear him, but by sending people to my rescue. Literally strangers in a strange new country that came. My neighbors, my son's schools, uh, parents. I mean, you name it, people came to my rescue. They would come, I was very shy. I, am, I have a big mouth and talk right now, but I was very shy. And they would come to me like, hi, how are you? What's your name? And they would know my story and they would say, how can I help you? I had a strangers literally stayed with me until two, three o'clock in the morning in an ER because my daughter had an ear infection and they were there to help me, to take care of me. That's why I call them angels. That's why the name angel came in this book. Um, Learned English, went back to school, became a nurse again, um, worked two jobs. I was very ambitious. I, tr I was trying to get, not to focus on what was missing, what was the issue. But my brand new house, brand new car, and on what day I sat down and I'm, I'm miserable. <laughs> what now? I did everything that I never dreamed of doing. It was in that journey that I started back again, praying, um, you didn't let me die. What is the story here? Where am I going from here? Because right now, I wanna kill myself again. I went to my doctors and I told her, like, I wanna kill myself. 
what should I do right now? Again, I prayed, and every time I was watching TV, there was a, a spiritual shows, and in the midst of all the searching, reading books and researching, I found uh, how to connect and work with angels, how to use angels to heal, not only myself, but also use it in helping my patients when they were suffering. This book has beautiful stories about the healing with angels, about my patients. They, it's not just about my journey, it's about the journey that I believe that my brother sacrificed his life in order for me to be here, to be an inspiration, to be a motivation, to tell people that you are not a small, you are good enough, you are powerful, we are powerful spirit in these physical bodies. We came here to enjoy life, not to suffer, and we have the power to create our destiny. That was the reason when I started working with angels and I learned how to, how to really be comfortable. I am not here to preach about God. I'm not here to preach about angels. It doesn't matter. We are men, women, um, what we believe, God, angels, whatever it is, they are here for us. God created angels to help us. We have literally help on, in heaven and on earth. Angels come different shapes, forms, and sizes. So we are powerful, please. That is the only thing that I want from my book to be an inspiration, motivate and inspire people to do, to dream big and work on their dreams and never, never give up. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Thank you. It's an overwhelming story. It Thank really you. Is. Not really a question as much as that I'm just so impressed with your success at getting to where you are right now. Thank you. I appreciate that. And that was how I found my purpose and my mission and life purpose that, you know, I, my brother sacrificed his life. Everybody did for me to be here. And the stories about how uh, some of my patients passed away in peace transition the other sides with the help of angels. And it's their stories that I needed to really make sure that everything is done to the way that um, everybody that read the book, like, oh my God, you live 10 lives in one lifetime in such a short time. And uh, the stories of my patients are very, very dear to my heart, so. Thank what you. happened to your sister-in-law? My? Your sister-in-law, your brother's wife. Uh, she, they, she's a still in Iran, and uh, all of my family, they live there. My mom came and visited me, uh, mm -hmm. for, um, stayed with me for a few months, but like, I don't like it. You work all the time. Like, what did you think? I'm going to walk here and they give me money. <laughs> uh, so, yes, she's happy. Um, my uh, niece and my nephews, they're happy. Um, everybody's happy living there. Um, it's tough situation for everyone. Have you gone back? Um, I don't have any intention. I had uh, nightmares for up to two years ago um, about uh, being there and I was stuck and I couldn't come back. That was for 25 um, years I had that and I had to get hypnosis and a lot of you know help. And that's why I, I started to go back to school and I'm a certified hypnotherapist as well. I have a um, business called Emerge Hypnosis and I see clients and um, I use the heaven and angels and hypnosis to help people to their limited thoughts and beliefs that we have so we can take care of them so we can move forward with life because we have the power to create whatever we want. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.